And let's take our Bibles and open up to Acts chapter 11 one more time. Acts chapter 11. Last week, we worked through verses 19 to 30 slowly, looking at each verse. And uh, there was something lurking in those verses that I wanted to address again this morning uh, a little differently. So we're going to do a part two on Luke eleven nineteen. I'm sorry, Acts. Luke wrote Acts. Acts eleven nineteen to thirty, and um, focus on a couple of things. I want to read the passage to us, and we'll pray. Okay. Acts eleven verse nineteen. So then, those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen. <clears throat> made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except to Jews alone. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. The news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. Then, when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord, for he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. And he left for Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year, they met with the church, and they taught considerable numbers. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Now at this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and began to indicate by the Spirit that there would certainly be a great famine all over the world. And this took place in the reign of Claudius. And in the proportion that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. And this they did, sending it in charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for um, its great power. We thank you for the power of the gospel for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, as we could even see firsthand through these words as we read this passage. And Father, we, your gospel still has the same power of yours today. Each of us who is a believer is evidence of the power of yours in the gospel. And we pray, God, that um, you would be powerful again today with this gospel in our lives. And that, Lord, you would draw us closer to your son, Jesus. Make us more resolute in heart to remain true to him. And, Father, where there is not yet belief or a turning to your son, Lord, by the power of your gospel, grant it today. Lord, help us to think carefully about um, what we can even learn from watching two churches form the first church partnership in the New Testament. Pray, Lord, that it would be helpful for us and that you would make us into a church that other gospel-loving churches would want to be friends with. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, in Acts eleven nineteen to 30, one church, the church in Jerusalem, saw a spiritual need in another church far away in Antioch, a Greek church. And they met that need. It was a spiritual need. They met that need, and they, they sent Barnabas to them. Later, that Greek church knew that a physical need was coming to the church in Judea and in Jerusalem, and they met that need by sending an offering back. This is the first partnership in the New Testament between churches. And I want to give some thought to this. It's been on my mind for the last two weeks. And I want to start with what is more simple, though, and move to what is more complex. I think it might be easier to think about how we do personal friendships and then talk about how you do church friendships, church partnerships. Everyone 
here operates by a set of criteria or a set of standards, you could call them values, that you commonly prize, that you prize, you probably couldn't sit down and write them out because it just happens instinctively for you in friendship. But that's what you're looking for in friendship. And there are two extremes that we try to avoid in friendships with that set of criteria or that set of standards or the set of values that you have. The first extreme would be to have a set of values so shallow, so broad, so undefined, so up for grabs that almost everybody could grab onto something and every proposal for friendship you would have to agree to because they have and hold to the same set of values you do. And the reality is, is you can't have meaningful friendships with everybody. You can't. That doesn't mean you're not kind to everybody, but it just means you can't have a meaningful relationship with everybody. The other extreme to avoid in friendships would be to restrict the set of values so much that you can't find anyone who only possesses those values that you have and no others. So the one extreme results in not being able to say no to any proposed friendship. The other results in the inability to say yes to any proposed friendship because the values are so restricted. So what's needed in friendship is a good set of criteria or values that both parties understand and both parties commonly prize so that then a friendship is mutually desired those commonly held values, the things that you prize together, become the basis, the foundation for a meaningful friendship. And something similar happens at the church to church level. There's a big movement today for churches to just all buddy up and be pals together, a real ecumenical move. A church shouldn't be so loose in its values, the things that it prizes, the and have them be so up for grabs that every proposed partnership can't be turned down. And likewise, a church shouldn't be so restricted in its values that no proposed church partnership could be accepted. Um, those would be two extremes we would want to avoid. What is needed is a good set of criteria, a good set of standards, a good set of values that we understand that another church understands and we mutually prize them and that becomes the foundation for a church-to-church -church friendship. Which brings us back to this unique passage in Acts chapter 11 because here we get to see the very first partnership form between churches in the New Testament. And I don't want you to forget how divergently, strikingly different these two churches were. One was made up of only Greeks and the other one was predominantly Jews. And in the Roman Empire in the first century, Greeks were not looking to hang out with Jews, and Jews were not looking to hang out with Greeks, which makes this partnership all the more remarkable, astounding. What these two churches commonly prized, it became a solid foundation for their partnership to stand on. And these should be what we commonly and mutually prize with other churches as well so that we can have a partnership with other churches. So what is this passage all about? I'll put it for you in the form of a question. Here it is. What did strikingly different churches commonly prize on the gospel mission? I'll give you four things. Number one, what did strikingly different churches commonly prize on the gospel mission? It was the preaching of the gospel. Look at chapter 11, verse 20. But there were some of those Jews who had fled from the persecution of Stephen they were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, and they came to Antioch, and they began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. That's that word that we've been calling gospelizing. It's the preaching of the good news as one verb, just to gospelize somebody. It means that the Jewish believers in Jesus who were from Jerusalem, it means they evangelized the Greeks with the core elements of the gospel. When you preach the core elements of the gospel, you are gospelizing someone, you are evangelizing them, and that is what took place. So, the believers from Jerusalem, they loved the gospel, we know, with its core elements, and the Greeks in Antioch found themselves eager to entrust themselves to those same core elements of the gospel. 
So the churches mutually valued, commonly prized the gospel, the core elements of the gospel, and those core elements being preached as good news to sinners. So what I want to do is I want to back up And I want to look back um, in the earlier chapters of Acts at the core elements of the gospel that the church in Jerusalem prized. So I'm going to take you on a little tour back through the book of Acts. Now, I'm going to give you three gospel cores, okay, the three cores of the gospel. You can write these down if you want. Uh, You can put them like as three categories across the top. The first one is the suffering of Christ. It's not on the screen. If you're looking for it, it will never show up. The suffering of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, and forgiveness of sins in Christ. I want you to see as we look through these many different passages that you could put any one of those verses in any one of those columns, or in some cases, some of them in two columns. Go back to Acts chapter 2, verse 23. Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost, and look what he says. This man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and you put him to death. This is a church that prized the suffering of Messiah and preached it. Look at chapter 2, verse 24. But God raised him up again. There's the resurrection. Putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. They prized the resurrection. Drop over to verse 36. Therefore, at the, this is the end of his sermon. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. There's the cross, the suffering of Jesus. Verse 38. Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The church valued forgiveness of sins. Look at verse, um, um, go to chapter 3, verse 13. Uh, Peter heals a, a lame man in the temple, and he has an opportunity to address the crowd that is gathered, and he says in verse 13, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. There's the resurrection. He glorified his servant Jesus, the one whom you delivered and disowned in the presence of Pilate. There's the suffering of Messiah. Look at verse 14. But you disowned the holy and righteous one, and you asked for a murderer to be granted to you. The cross and the suffering again. Verse 15, but you put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. So the suffering and the resurrection of Christ being preached. Drop down to verse 18. The things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. There's the suffering of Messiah. Verse 19. Therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away. The church valued forgiveness of sins. Uh, Look at verse 26. For you first, God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. The resurrection of Jesus again. Look at chapter 4, verse 2. Being greatly disturbed, the religious leadership of the temple... Because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. The resurrection mentioned again. Drop down to verse 10. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name this man stands here before you in good health. Here's the suffering and the resurrection of Messiah again. Verse 33 of that chapter. With great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. They prized the resurrection. Chapter 5, verse 30, Peter gets arrested and he has an opportunity to speak again. And he says, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus whom you had put to death by hanging him on a cross. The suffering of Messiah, the resurrection of Messiah. Verse 31, he is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. There it is again. Chapter 8, verse 22, as the church from Jerusalem scattered into Samaria, Peter came across a magician named Simon, and he said to him in verse 22, Therefore repent of this wickedness of yours, and pray the Lord that if possible the intention of your heart may be forgiven. Forgiveness of sins again. Peter did the same thing in chapter 10, verse 39, when he was with Cornelius the Gentile. 
Look at verse 39. We are witnesses of all these things he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put him to death by hanging him on a cross, the suffering of Messiah. Verse 40. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible. Resurrection. And not to all the people, verse 41, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God. That is, to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. Verse 43. Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. The church prized the suffering of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, and forgiveness of sin in Jesus Christ. Do you prize these things personally? Is the suffering of Jesus in your place everything to you? The fact that a, an actual dead man rose from a grave His body is not there. It did not decay. Does that mean everything to you? The fact that you can have your sins wiped away from God no other way except through faith and repentance, faith in Jesus, repentance toward Jesus, does that mean everything to you? It meant everything to the first church in Jerusalem. And when the believers from the Jerusalem church gospelized, chapter 11, verse 20, the Greeks in Antioch, the content of their gospelizing, the content of their evangelization must have been the suffering of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, and forgiveness of sins in him. An assembly of sinners does not become the church apart from these core elements of the gospel being preached. Both churches came to mutually prize these core gospel elements. Both believed, trusted in these core elements. The preaching of these core elements was something that they gratefully received. There would have been no partnership between these two churches, two very different churches. There would have been no partnership between either one of them if either one of them did not prize the suffering of Messiah the resurrection of Messiah, or forgiveness of sins in Messiah. There would have been no basis for a friendship for them to stand on. It would be hard to envision today a partnership between one church and another church, one church that prizes the suffering of Jesus and the other one that negotiates it away. It would be hard to imagine a partnership forming between one church that actually believes a man who was physically dead was resurrected three days later and another church that doesn't find that scientifically plausible. It would be difficult to form a partnership where forgiveness of sins is not prized in Jesus Christ. And let's think of each one of these four things I'm going to give to you that we prize. Think of them this way. If you want to have a good friend, What does your mom say? Be a good friend, right? If you want to have a strong partnership in the gospel with other churches, if that's what we want, then we need to make sure that we are the right kind of church that we must be. The place to begin is to make sure that we prize the core elements of the gospel, that we prize the suffering of Messiah, we we prize the resurrection of Messiah, we prize forgiveness of sin in him. Another church that would prize those things, we would hope that they would find us to be a good friend in the gospel mission. So what did strikingly different churches commonly prize on the gospel mission? First, the preaching of the gospel. Secondly, the grace of God. Look at chapter 11, verse 23. When Barnabas got to that new church in Antioch, all he could see was the grace of God. When he arrived and he witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced. He rejoiced. Why did he rejoice? Because he prized the grace of God. He prized it greatly. Let's briefly walk back and see the grace of God at work in the church of Jerusalem. We're going to take several passes back through the early chapters of Acts. Go back to chapter 2, verse 39. Peter preaching finishes and he exhorts those who have heard his sermon. He says, the promise 
The promise that you would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. A promise made to those that God calls to himself, what do you call that except grace? The church valued the unmerited favor of God. Look at verse 47. They were praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. God adding those that he saves into the church. What do you call that except God's grace? Chapter 3, verse 26. For you first, God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. He raised up his servant for a bunch of wicked people so that he could turn them from their wicked ways. What do you call that except the grace of God? Look at chapter 4, verse 33. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. Chapter 5, verse 31. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and to grant forgiveness of sins. What do you call any gift that is given? It's grace. Repentance is a gift from God. Forgiveness of sins, a gift from him. And then Peter, as a representative from the church in Jerusalem, he went into a Gentile's home, remember? Acts chapter 10, verse 34. He said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. What do you call a God who doesn't show partiality? You call him a gracious God, a God of grace. Chapter 11, verse 17, when Peter got to Jerusalem and he had some explaining to do for what happened, he says in verse 17, therefore, if God gave to them the same gift as he gave to us also after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? What is he saying? I'm not going to get in the way of God's grace to Gentiles. We had that grace. He gave to us that gift. He gave it to them. He values grace. He's not going to obstruct it. When, verse 18, they heard this, they quieted down and glorified God, saying, well then, God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. The giving of repentance is the grace of God. And again, when Barnabas gets to Antioch, all he could see was that same grace at work, and he rejoiced. I'm going to ask you a question. Do you personally rejoice in the unmerited favor of God? That he does not set before you a... a a standard by which you must operate before he will pay attention to you. But while you are wicked, he did everything he needed to to turn you from your wicked ways. That's grace. Do you prize that? You cannot prize anything else. Anything else you prize will only damn you. Prize the grace of God. There would have been no partnership between these two churches had either one of them not prized the undeserved favor of God in salvation. If one of them felt that God's grace was something to prize and the other church felt that, you know, merit, merit is something to not let go of yet, there would have been no basis for a friendship or a partnership to stand on. And if we want to have a good friend, let's make sure to be a good friend first. If we want to have a strong partnership in the gospel with other churches, we must be sure that we prize the grace of God grace of God in salvation, the grace of God towards us. We, we've sinned boldly against God. Have we not? Have you not? I have. We prize his grace. And another church which similarly values God's grace will find us to be for them a good friend to have. What did strikingly different churches commonly prize on the gospel mission, the, the preaching of the gospel, and, and then the grace of God? Thirdly, belief and repentance. Look at chapter 11, verse 21. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. Who are the ones who turned to the Lord? The ones who believed. What happened to the ones who believed? Well, they turned to the Lord. Belief and repentance. Belief and repentance. The hand of the Lord was there, meaning God's God was being gracious to them. He was granting them the precious gifts of belief in Jesus and repentance towards Jesus. This was a church that prized belief and repentance. 
And I'll remind you of and refer you back to last week's message where we were able to spend more time in, and spell out the unique relationship between belief and repentance, how you can actually clarify the one by thinking of the other. Uh, briefly, just as a reminder, if you, if you say you believe, the way to clarify and to affirm that you are a believer is to ask yourself, well, that means then I claim to have repented. I claim to have turned from my sin, and I have become now an ongoing repenter. When I see my sin, I repent. That's what it means to believe. You have changed. That's what repentance is. It's to change in the most radical way possible. If you would be someone on the vice versa, you claiming to, to want to change, I want to change. I need to change. I am changing. How do you clarify that? Have you believed? Have you believed in Christ? Are you entrusting yourself on a daily basis to the gospel so that you can continually change? Belief and repentance are something to prize. I want you to look first with me. Let's look first at how the church in Jerusalem prized both belief and repentance for salvation. I've got several verses for you to take a look at. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Watch this. Peter, at the end of his sermon, when they said, what do we do? He said, repent. Repent. Turn. Look at verse 44. And all those who had believed were together. It was those who believed who were together. They they trusted the message of the gospel. Chapter 3, verse 16. On the basis of faith in his name, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know. And the faith which comes through him has given this perfect health in the presence of you all. Faith was even important in this healing. Verse 19, therefore repent and return. Repent and return. The church valued repentance. Verse 26, God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. Chapter 4, verse 4, but many of those who had heard the message believed. They believed. Chapter 4, verse 32, the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul. It was a congregation of believers. Chapter 5, verse 14, and all the more believers in the Lord. Multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their number. Chapter 5, verse 31, He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior to grant repentance. There it is again. And when the church from Jerusalem was scattered, they took belief and they took repentance and they prized them when they went and did preaching in Samaria. And God graciously moved the Samaritans to prize belief and repentance also. Look at chapter 8, verse 12. And when they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, men and women alike. Verse 22, they exhorted Simon, the magician, to turn, to repent of this wickedness. Peter took the belief and repentance that he prized into the greater Judean region is also chapter 9, verse 35. He raised up Aeneas in Lydda, And all who lived at Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. Repentance. Verse 42. It became known all over Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Belief. And then Peter did the same thing with the Gentile Cornelius. Look at chapter 10, verse 43. Of him, all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. And then in chapter 11, verse 17, when he explains to the Jews in Jerusalem why he went to the Gentiles, we believed in the Lord Jesus, they believed in the Lord Jesus. Verse 18, well, God granted them repentance. These are two churches that had no trouble at all partnering because they valued commonly, they prized belief and repentance towards Jesus Christ. They prized both of them. They didn't prize one over the other. They didn't accent one to the distortion or the diminishment of the other. And the question you you need to ask yourself this morning is, do you prize both of them? Both of them. Do you prize faith 
that results in a changed life? And do you go after change in your life by faith? The only ones who will be able to stand in the judgment of Jesus Christ are the ones who value both of them, who prize both of them. The one who says, well, I can believe, but I don't have to change, is not going to stand before Jesus Christ. And the one who would say, I'm trying my best to change, but is not trusting Christ, will never stand before Jesus. You must be one who prizes both to be safe. There would have been no partnership between these two churches if either one of them did not prize belief or repentance. Can you imagine if one of them said, well, I think it's okay to believe, but you don't have to change. Can you imagine them having a care and a concern for each other as they have? Or the other one said, you can change, but you don't have to believe. How would one church that prizes belief in Jesus and demands repentance from sin partner with a church that does not demand believers to repent? How would you partner? There's one more important point within this to make about belief in Jesus Christ. And it may seem obvious to you, but um, it's not all that obvious out there today. Acts ties together belief in Jesus and being added to the church, okay? This is probably a no-brainer to you, but I want you to think carefully about this. Acts puts no space between you believe and you are put in the church. You repent, you are put in the church. The only ones added to the church were those who believed. So let's talk about belief and repentance for a moment for entrance into the church. Look at chapter 2, verse 41. Those who had received his word were baptized, and that day they were added about 3,000 souls. The only ones who were added were the ones who received the word and who were baptized. Verse 44, and all those who had believed were together and they had things in common. Which ones were together? The ones who believed Verse 47, they were praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day which people? People who were interested? No, the people who were being saved. God only adds one kind of person to his church. It's the one who is saved. It is the one who believes, the one who repents. Look at chapter 4, verse 4. Many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. The only ones that they counted and added to the prior number were the ones who believed. Look at verse 32 of chapter 4. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul. How is the congregation described? It's a congregation of those who what? Believe. Chapter 5, verse 14. And all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their number. Again, who's being added to the number? The ones who believed. In chapter 8, verse 12, in Samaria, when they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. The ones that were identified out as the ones who are to be a part of the church in Samaria are the ones who have believed. And in Antioch, it was the same thing. They believed, they turned to the Lord, and they were, that church was called Christians. Chapter 11, verse 26. So listen, the notion that you don't have to believe, but you could be counted a part of the church was foreign to them. The idea that you did not believe, but you could be a part of the church was foreign to them. Luke is very careful to write more than once, many, many times, that the only ones who were a part of the church were who? The ones who believed. That is a foreign thought, unfortunately, today. If one church made no distinction between the unbeliever and the believer in its midst, how do you partner? What do you do when it's time to take communion? How do you serve in ministry with an unbeliever? I talked to a gentleman one time who was so excited about a missions project that he had participated in, and and he said that he was, what made him so excited about it is, is because there were believers and unbelievers side by side doing mission. And I, 
How does that, how does that work? How does an unbeliever do the gospel mission to other non-believers? How do you partner with that? That's a confusing message. You don't have to believe in Jesus, but you can have all of the benefits that believers in Jesus have in the body. And if we want to have a good friend, we must be a good friend, and we must prize belief and repentance in our own lives. We must prize it for salvation. We also, as a church, need to prize it for entrance into the church. So what did strikingly different churches commonly prize on the gospel mission? The preaching of the gospel, the grace of God, belief and repentance for salvation, and as a prerequisite for entrance into the church. And lastly, the church, these churches prized leadership that cultivated faithfulness to Jesus Christ. Leadership that cultivated faithfulness to Jesus Christ. Leadership that made it very clear that Jesus is the point of life, not a part of life. The point of life. Antioch's great benefit came when Barnabas came to them. He's described in verse 24 of chapter 11 as a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. But why did they benefit greatly when he came? Because he prized faithfulness to Jesus Christ. That was all that he had ever known in the church in Jerusalem, and he brought that value to Antioch. Look at verse 21. Watch this. The hand of the Lord, and that's the Lord Jesus in verse, mentioned in verse 20. The hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. So look, when you repent, the whole point is Jesus. It's the Lord Jesus. You turn from sin to a person, okay? You're turning to a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's when they sent Barnabas, verse 22, off to Antioch. He witnessed the grace of God, and look at the kind of man he is in verse 23. He encouraged them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord Jesus, to remain true to him. Verse 24, he was a good man, and considerable numbers were brought to the Lord, more brought to the Lord. Then he went off and he looked for Saul. And he spent an entire year there, and he met with the church, and they taught considerable numbers, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Listen, that's a mocking term, you remember? It's a mocking term that was given to them by the unbelievers in Antioch. But listen, at least the unbelievers in Antioch knew that the believers were all about Jesus Christ, right? And Barnabas was a huge part of that. The focal point of the gospel is the Lord Jesus. The gospel does not direct any sinner to any other bullseye except him. And the leadership of the early church in Jerusalem carefully and clearly laid out Jesus Christ before the people. And then they sent a man, Barnabas, who was concerned about the Lord Jesus to them. And he exhorted them to remain faithful and true, resolute in heart, faithful to Jesus. I won't take you through all of these um, passages because we don't have time, but all of those passages, if you'll just look them up, it's all about Jesus putting, uh, Peter putting Jesus Christ out in front of everyone all of the time in his messages. Jesus the Nazarene, Jesus of Nazareth. These two churches were riveted on Jesus Christ. Why? because their leadership directed them all of the time to Jesus Christ, to only prize him and to prize no one else. That was a solid basis for both churches to have a partnership and a friendship to stand on. Can you imagine what might have happened if one church was content for Jesus to just merely be a part of life and a part of their purpose? then there would have been no partnership in the gospel. And today, the same thing. If the leadership of one church prizes Jesus Christ as the point of life and as the purpose of life, but another church only wants Jesus to be a part, and both leaderships disciple their flocks into that kind of thinking about Jesus, how do you partner? How do you partner? And lastly, one more time, if we want to have a good friend, we need to be a good friend. Do we prize Jesus Christ above all things? Do you prize him above all things? Do you want to remain true 
to Jesus with a resolute heart. In so doing, another church that loves Jesus will find us to be a good friend. That's what we must be. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to put our sights on Jesus. We thank you for your grace in our lives that has only led us to do so. Father in heaven, we pray that you would be kind to us and draw us closer to him, that you would help us to be faithful to him. Lord, would you stir my affections for your son Jesus more and more. Father, would you add to our passion courage to obey him. Father, may we be known because we prize him above all things. Father, help us in doing that just for our own soul's sake, but Lord, we also ask it this morning as we think about this subject that you would do it so that we could be a good friend to another church. Lord, as we even, Lord willing, plant churches, there could not be a more strikingly different church than a tribal church in a mountain region of Papua New Guinea. But Lord, I pray that you would make us a good friend to them when by your grace they believe and repent and they love the preaching of the gospel and they cherish your